Good evening. I'd like to call the order of the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees of Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. Today is Tuesday, May 21st. May I have a call to order? Mr. Kaling? Present. Mr. Quadro? Present. Dr. Spencer Robinson? Here. Dr. Bonner? Present. And Mayor Ciara is due. So. Mayor, you stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Yes. The mission of Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School is to prepare students for social responsibility employment, and post-secondary education through rigorous, applied, technical, and academic programs. Thank you. Is there any participation by the public this evening? Okay. Good evening. Um, I am here on behalf of my colleague Tracy Burke, the art instructor, and um, I'd like to present you all with a copy of this uh, year's Viking Moonstone. It's our yeah. literary magazine. It's six volume. We're, we're uh, flowering asset that it's volume six, but um, here it is. And also uh, some photos from our launch, which um, was hosted by Strong Dog Writers and Forbes Library. So some photos from that. And I just wanted to let you know that um, we, uh, this year, different than all the other years, we, um, we, we took grants from 11 different um, towns in, in our, <coughs> so, um, and we, uh, $3,690 for, for the continued success of the right to so, <coughs> While you're passing those out, I want to say how much um, I appreciate that our students have a chance to um, participate in this kind of activity and elevate their, their creativity. Um, and I love that you do the launch at Forbes Library. I have wanted to go every yes. time you do it, and I have had Conflict this is this was for next. This was our second year, and we we um, uh, have no reason to to think that it will not go on. It's been a great um, partnership between Forbes and Straw Dogs, and um, the uh, director and all the uh, writers are very interested in um, the kids who uh, participate in any kind of artwork. They uh, are just so supportive. So. Um, Yes, and we'd, we'd be happy to have you next year. So thank you. Um, thank you for all your support, and um, have a great evening and meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. I was delighted to be able to participate in the MASC Day on the Hill recently with Dr. Lincoln Hooker. We started at the University Club with a program that included Representative Denise Garland, co-chair of the Joint Committee on Education and Representative Steve Altrino, who's the vice chair. Interim Commissioner of Education Russell Johnston also briefed us on the priorities for his tenure. We then went to the State House for an unrivaled feast prepared by students from many of the Commonwealth's vocational schools. From there, we went to a meeting with Senator Comerford's policy director and Senator Lewis's chief of staff a member of Representative Sabadosa's staff, and finally, the education analyst for the Senate Ways and Means Committee. In each meeting, we advocated for subsidizing transportation funding for rural school districts whose students attend Smith Oak, increasing the number of seats in vocational schools statewide, and allowing our students to be eligible for a hoisting license. At two of the, the, these meetings, there was broad representation from other school districts in Western Massachusetts. Thank you. Mr. Parker. Um, our building project is on track to move forward, and I think Mr. Or Dr. Lincoln Hooker will elaborate that on more during this report. But that's good news, so uh, I will leave it at that and we'll further 
discuss that. Thank you. And uh, the uh, event that we attended up on the hill, I was only able to stay for half a day. I do with, I agree with the uh, setting that they had it at the UMass Club uh, was far none one of the best. It had a 30-second floor in Boston that you could oversee the whole city and Charles River, and it was just beyond comprehension. But the program itself, again, was just fabulous. And the people that, that work every day that don't get the credit, uh, I'll tell you, they shine uh, at this event. It was absolutely wonderful. Uh, I did, uh, that afternoon, had to get on a debt of Massachusetts, and my son uh, is a judge, and I had the opportunity to watch him in action in the courthouse. So that was a family event that I had to attend that was uh, special. And uh, thank you. This time I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the April 9th, 2024 Board of Directors meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Introduce our, our two Skills USA advisors, uh, Mr. Lamore and Ms. Sherwood, uh, to do a brief presentation on uh, all the wonderful things that have been happening this year with Skills. So I'll be the clicker. Okay. So we're here to talk about the year in review. Click. So the year in review. It starts with these two amazing advisors. Um, and I know we're going to have an intro, so <laughs> here we go. Um, we started with a district competition. There were 48 students that registered to take the test. Um, one did not um, come to school that day, so 47 actually took the test. The results. So gold medalist, silver medalist, and then the which got to the bronze. Okay. Um, so that was, that was pretty average for us. Um, usually about a third of the students that compete at the district level medal and move on to the state competition. Uh, we had 13 eligible for states, um, 11 students competed, as you see there. Just a group shot of everybody. Uh, drum roll. Um, so out of those 11, one student took a silver. Ariel Ginsberg uh, from Advanced Manufacturing took a silver in CNC Technician. And uh, we also took a bronze in plumbing from Charter Lemoyne. Both those guys are seniors. So, glory pick for those, those young men. And of course, uh, myself with my plumbing warriors. <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of candidates with the kids uh, while they're getting ready to compete. This year was hard to see a lot of the competitions. Yeah, for some whatever reason they were they were behind closed doors or, or we missed uh, the students just traveling from one area to another, so only able to get a few shots. Uh, of course, none of this would be possible without the fantastic support of the Board of Trustees and the Smith Oak administration. Ding. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. Do you want to talk about national <laughs> trip this year? What we are planning? Right. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll even do a precursor to that. So, um, two years ago, we had a student from Plumbing uh, take a silver at Nationals, and that actually put him in the running for World Skills uh, to go to France. And we made it all the way to the number three spot. And um, they, he did some Zoom interviews, and uh, they they sent him to Michigan, I believe, to do an in-person interview. Um, and unfortunately, we, we didn't quite make the cut for that. But uh, to be number two in the country, and then to be selected, you know, as number three to go travel the world to do what these kids do is, is pretty fantastic. So um, our, our name is still out there. Our reputation still holds strong. Um, and as Dr. Lincoln over said, unfortunately, we didn't have a gold medalist this year at states to make it to nationals. Um, so, uh, Ms. Sherman, myself, and uh, Mr. Bianca, and Dr. Lincoln Hooker are in the process of getting uh, some plaques made for out front by the main office uh, that will highlight the state medalists. And from there, uh, we're also in the works to have uh, like championship banners made for the cafeteria for the students that uh, medaled at nationals. 
so all that's in the works. And actually, I, I believe our, our plaques are here today, um, so we'll get those up very soon, and I'm still waiting to hear back from the banner company on, uh, on the design for us. How long have you each been advising? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Go ahead, Ms. Sherman. So I started uh, in 2014, and I was asked um, by Shannon Brisbois, who's um, the advisor then to chaperone. So I wasn't an advisor, but I started my first year. Um, for some reason, Mr. Lamore has been teaching the same amount of time, plus a few months, because he started in February. But when we go to the dinners, he gets like, I don't know, 13 years. I get 13 years credit, and I tell Ms. Sherman it's because uh, some of us made it the world skills a couple of years. So uh, they, they, they tack it on. Nice. Uh, but the actual is nine you, years. Nine years for myself. Could you each um, tell us a little bit about what motivates you to do this? First, okay. well, um, the first thing I went to was state, the state competition, and that was I thought amazing until I went to nationals, and then that kind of like blew my mind. Um, just seeing the kids work, seeing what they develop in their products and the maturity and just the experience. Some of them have never flown. We went a few years ago with a, a young man who had never flown, like never really stayed in a hotel. So it kind of like work them through all that and just support them through it. Yeah, Ms. Sherman said it, said it best. Um, <coughs> a few years ago before COVID, um, districts was uh, at McCann Tech and it was a paper test and it was, you know, Kind of boring really because you don't get to see the kids do anything and you don't know anything until the results come in and then after covid they changed it to a computer-based test which okay i mean still you don't get to really see much but like you said states is, is really where it's at you get to see the kids put the hands on the tools spin the wrenches you know bake the cakes do the makeup and all, all kinds of stuff that they do and that's that's fantastic to see and then like you said once you get the nationals that is that's a phenomenal sight to see like you get the best of the best yeah, interesting the reputation this small school has against like the big schools I don't know, like we have a name yeah. even at nationals people know our school it's awesome it's, it's so wonderful for our students to have the, this opportunity i know for both each one of my kids it was <coughs> transformative in different ways and a big difference between my older daughter who got to do the districts in person and then my son who took the paper test at mccann and he just like for her she was connecting with her peers um regionally and then across the state and the identification of her with that group on this campus and then yeah. again with other you know groups from other campuses uh, was just phenomenal and not so much with my other one and that for different reasons also that like she was super motivated but I as a parent was so, was so appreciative that they each had that opportunity um, it yeah just she it really helped her blossom especially but I'm so glad you did that too everybody else's kids um, if they want to pursue it. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Right here. I mean, you also bring us up to date. I know you've talked about local, state, and then national. Why don't you talk about international, what you've done in plumbing? So, like I said, for, for internationals, um, Mr. Patterson, I believe it was the year was 2012, um, we had our first plumber go to uh, the World Skills Competition that was in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, no, I'm sorry. That was uh, Leipzig, Germany. Uh, before that, Mr. Brook from Collision Repair actually had the first student from Smith uh, to compete internationally, and that was that was in Canada. Uh, but Mr. Patterson went to Germany, and uh, and then a few years later, I got the chance to travel to Abu Dhabi, which was fantastic. I, I, I love the heat, so that was that was definitely my home away from home. <laughs> uh, and the culture out there was was amazing. They say the streets are paved in gold. They are paved in gold. They can only stack the money so high before they have to spend it on something frivolous out there. It is, it is wild. Um, and then two years later after that, uh, very fortunate to have another student uh, make it to the international level. We went to Kazan, Russia, which was also very cool. That was, they, they spoke more English in Abu Dhabi than, of course, they did Russia. So, um, you know, I, I found out that, uh, you know, obviously money talks. So we went to the... Uh, the restaurant in the hotel and you, you know you slip the guy a few extra bucks for a tip and all of a sudden the English menu comes out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Blake, what's up? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, very 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 cool to get that chance to you know to be with the students and you know like I shouldn't say some of them have I've never been away from home so to travel you know eight ten thousand miles away from home is it's eye opening for 
medical sense. Sounds great. Well, we, I've had said many oh, we had other students medal at nationals, and they just don't have the um, like contest for them at the international level. Yeah. I'm just going to say the people that travel from Florence down here, and they see our open field, and if the cows aren't there, they get nervous. <laughs> they have no idea about the 600 students that are in here that some are traveling around the world representing Smith's location. So, as you said, we are well known in some of our career paths. We have 15 courses, and we excel in most of them. And I'm so proud of that, being a former student as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, good evening. Uh, I want to introduce you. You have a new student uh, representative. I know I announced at a previous meeting uh, that, um, uh, not Don, sorry, Brandon Diaz uh, was no longer going to be a part of the group. Um, so we did go out, and one of the members of uh, the Principal's Youth Advisory is Phoebe Perez, 10th grader in electrical. Uh, and she agreed to come on as the student rep. So I don't know if you'd like to take a few moments and introduce yourself, talk about yourself. Hi, I'm Phoebe Perez. <coughs> I'm a sophomore in our electrical shop. I'm one of the five girls in there. Um, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Why do you want to? What the track, what appealed to you about being on this? Why did you volunteer? Um, so my whole life has always been about college and after high school and what it looks like and this is definitely something that goes on to a college application and they see it and they're like oh this person gets involved in a lot of different school activities um i played last year i was on our varsity softball team this past year i was on our new girls lacrosse team and i play volleyball as well um i'm part of our youth advisory and i'm part of junior chef i kind of just pick up as many clubs as possible and i make that would make me look better for colleges. Where do you live? I live in South Hadley. So when I came here, there was only a small <coughs> window of shops that I could choose from. And I felt that electrical fit the best out of all of them. And I like it. It's from there. How old are you? I'm 16. Great. And what career path, if you're successful in moving on to college, would you like to pursue? So my plan after high school is to move down to the Cape. Uh, we have a Cape House down there. Um, I plan on going to Bridgewater University, or um, even Cape Cod Community. I want to be an electrician for a little bit. Um, and then what I want to study in college is hospitality. Um, <coughs> I'm definitely a people person, and I want to like expand that as much as possible. And um, I want to be a wedding planner during the off-seasons. Um, <laughs> well, I guess to fill the gaps. <laughs> I know it's kind of very different than what I chose for a shop and what I plan on doing. Electrical is where the money is. Wedding planning is just kind of a side thing. Dom, you want to talk about your career? <laughs> so, when I was younger, I really wanted to become a cop. And that stuck with me until last year. So I wanted to become a firefighter paramedic. I I just recently, like five months ago, just got into the town of Hatfield's fire department, and I'm an intern over there. So I just go on the calls, observe them. It gives me something on my resume and shows that I really care about the community, and just gives me a head start on everything. So they do, uh, both of them do have some information to share. Also, we divide up the programs, the athletics and other things, uh, and, and clubs, so that they can interact with those teachers and advisors and see if there's any information that they want to have shared out at, to the board of trustees. So I think, Phoebe, you want to go first? Find on my phone. Sorry. I'm slightly unprepared. Whatever, Mike, you can my notes. <laughs> Um, so to start, um, I emailed Ms. Burke um, about the art club. So they had about 40 students get photos into the um, yearbook, which is the rhinestone, which Mr. Bianca has, or actually every single one of you has. <laughs> um, so they got to add their work into the yearbook this year. And then PE, um, I talked with Mr. B in person, or I don't know, I'm going to say Mr. B. Um, he wanted to basically touch on what our tournaments look like and how our weeks look like. 
Um, so during our PE, each person has a period of it. I have six periods. And um, we have a week long of one activity. So um, like volleyball, we do, you learn how to play it to start with. So you learn the general ideas of it, you learn the background of it. And then at the end of the week, every Friday, um, you do a big tournament style. And then whatever team wins or whatever kid wins, they get their photo. Um, and in B building, we have like a board thing in there with a bunch of kids' photos with their like trophies. And every kid wants the trophy. Like, every kid wants a photo with that trophy. Um, I think I have a few in there. I'm sure Don has a few in there. So it's kind of just our way of like being able to be a part of it and having fun with it. Um, and this year specifically, we got to do a throwback to elementary school games, and um, the seniors loved that. I think actually everybody loved that, but I think that the seniors, they did it for the seniors, um, and the seniors really enjoyed that. Um, and then also recently they had their pickleball tournament, um, which means they got to go down to the park, and they got to go play pickleball with a few other students, and those students have been hand-selected as PE All-Stars. So the people who participate for the whole week and put effort into whatever they're doing. Um, I did not go. I'm not a fan of pickleball. <laughs> but um, the kids always look forward to that at the end of the year as well. Because you, you get out of school for a few periods. Um, and then I talked with FFA, you know Miss Irish. Me and her talked a little bit. She wanted to share that Grace Clemens was in the top 10 at nationals and received an FFA banner. Um, and then also we have our FFA banquet on the 23rd. And um, if you haven't RSPV yet, RSPV, if you are invited, which I'm sure you all are. Um, and then they also have the dairy evaluation team, the forestry team, um, and then they have multiple different public speakers coming to visit. Um, at that time, that gathering. And then um, they have another one going to speak at Nationals this coming October. Um, and then Mr. White, who is my teacher, the electrical teacher, um, wanted to highlight that the juniors have been working on habitat homes, habitat for communities, and have been building different things for them for the past few months. Um, and how that works is that um, Mr. White gets a habitat house for us. So next year my class will have one. Um, and he brings us out to habitat and we get to learn, we get to do hands-on stuff and learn what it's actually like to be building, not building a house, but wiring a house. Um, and it definitely gives us the background skill and it looks good on resumes. Um, and then carpentry, um, they also are on habitat. Um, they're I'm pretty sure their freshmen are the only ones who go on and off of it. I don't really think they're on it very often. Um, their sophomores are on it, their juniors, and then some of their seniors are on it. And um, they just completed a three-bedroom home at Habitat. And they're very proud of it. And they also just completed finishing the shed, um, the shed that they're selling. So if you need another shed, <laughs> it's always good to support Smith. Um, and then agricultural <coughs> mechanics, I talked with Mr. Reed. Um, he's one that he's new this year. He's worked at Smith in the past, but he just became an agricultural teacher over there. Um, and they just got a big grant. They got $100,000 worth of equipment over there. So they got new, I think they got eight new welders. Yeah, they got eight new welders, some vents. They got welding simulators, which they are very excited for. Um, and they got a few diesel engines so they can work on it and expand the kids' um, interests and knowledge on everything so when, the girl, when everyone leaves there, they have the most knowledge that they can know. Um, and then collision repair. So unfortunately, Mr. Brooks is retiring this coming year. He's been with us for 25 years. Um, as Mr. Lamore had said, that he had gone to internationals or something like that. He's the first one who brought the Smith kid there. He's been here the longest out of all of the teachers here, or out of all of the shop teachers here, um, it's Mr. Brooks. He's had a good long run with us. Um, he's actually very sad to leave. I was talking with him about it today. Um, but he's ready. He's been here long enough. 
Um, and then with the kids, their freshman class, their biggest class they've ever had, they have 12 kids, they're full. Um, <coughs> the furthest that they've gotten is about 11. They've had 10, 11, but no pads. They've never had 12. Um, and there's a few females in a shop, which are always good because we love having the females move into more of the male dominated shops. Um, and then they have their seniors graduating this week. This week. We have eight of them. There's two girls graduating. So everyone's excited about that. Uh, but no one else wanted to share with me anything else. Thank you. I have a question. You made some comment about uh, throwback elementary. Yeah. Or can you elaborate? So basically, what it looked like was every single day we had a different. Um, like thing that you would do in elementary school. So the first day, um, we like got cart things, like the wheelie carts that you sit on, you go zooming around the like um, gym. We all had we had races for those. <coughs> Everyone loved them. Um, I just really remember having the big parachute, and every single kid loving that. We played fishy, fishy, cross my ocean. Um, Cat and mouse. It was just like it was really just going back to elementary school and playing those games that you haven't played in years when you big were younger. Balls. You had the big balls, got to run around the gym. It was fun. It was definitely like the best week of gym. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, Health Tech shared that they had no news to report. They haven't, they haven't really said anything. Uh, criminal justice. Uh, I remember they went on a field trip with their senior group for their last time being in shop. Uh, the seniors really liked it. It was a bunch of obstacle courses that they went on. And they just enjoyed it and they liked spending time with their instructors for the last time before moving on to college or whatever they wanted to do. Uh, for math with Ms. Flores, she shared that Ms. Clark Herself, Ms. Rodriguez, and Mr. Holder brought the juniors to Apex on Monday, May 13th. Uh, the feedback was very positive with them. They rode bumper cars, they played laser tag, they bowled in a bunch of arcade games. That was a fan favorite too. Ms. Flores and Mr. Bianca ran a secret pal swap during the week of teacher slash staff appreciation week. 36 staff members participated. The themes were Favorite Color, Homemade Tuesday, Wild Card Wednesday, Tasty Treat Thursday, and Favorite Friday. For Humanities, uh, Ms. Kehoe already um, touched on it about the sixth edition of the Viking Runestone and the in-house celebration on April 25th and a reading at the Ford's Library on April 11th. For Spanish, Mr. Mendelssohn and Smith Volk was mentioned in an article that ran in the Bedford Citizens about a collaboration with uh, several tech schools aiming at world languages standards and the curriculums needed for vocational students. He also took uh, his Spanish classes to a field trip to eat at a Mexican restaurant where the students experience the Mexican food and the difference and they also practice ordering Spanish, which was good. Uh, four students successfully completed the requirements for Massachusetts State Seal of Biliteracy. Uh, one senior will be handed this on graduation. Uh, the other three who are juniors will receive it next year. Three additional juniors pass the three of the four exams to be candidates for the SEAL. And they'll have another opportunity to pass the fourth exam next school year. And that's all I got. That's good. Thank you. The best reports. Yeah. Perfect. I yeah. appreciate the intel. Very good question. Yeah. Yes. The um, 
state seals of bioliteracy that were earned um, in Spanish or other languages? Spanish. Spanish. Yeah, they were all in Spanish. Yeah. Yeah, we did have other students that I think were eligible to take a different language, um, but they chose not to participate. I'm so glad our state offers it, and I'm so glad our school has students who, who um, sought it and earned it. Yeah, I think it's an incredible uh, it's a great credential. credential. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. So, um, go ahead. I'm very quick. What does FFA stand for? Future Farmers of America. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Bianca, could you elaborate on why it is such a big deal? What is the fight literacy? Yeah, so the, the state seal of biliteracy, uh, students have to take, they not only have to be proficient or higher on MCAS, which means that you're fully literate in English, right? So reading, writing, speaking. Um, but then they also have to prove that they are in an additional language. So it's not just, um, I think a lot of people might come out of high school and be somewhat good at conversational mm -hmm. language. It doesn't mean that they're fully literate. So they get tested using the Apple test. Uh, it's an international test, uh, and they're tested on their reading, writing, um, speaking abilities. So the, all the all the different parts of the language. So you really have to show mastery. So it's uh, very comprehensive. Very comprehensive, and uh, as far as being a, a you know career technical school, having that <clears throat> seal on your diploma signifies that, it, like um, Dr. Spencer Robinson said, it's a huge credential. That's that's an employee. Thing. For our students, so we definitely want to pursue as many as help as many students as we can. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So half my report had already been shared. So thank you. Much better job than I could. So again, I just want to congratulate underneath instructional leadership. Uh, I, I just thinking back about this past month, uh, the senior season with all the activities. <clears throat> It's refreshing to see the rigor that our students live up to and achieve uh, in, in many different ways. And I'm just talking about the Massachusetts State School of Biliteracy. So Ethan Ortiz is the senior this year that we're walking across the state uh, on, his, on his diploma. Uh, so congratulations to Ethan. Uh, last month, uh, a few of us went down to Worcester uh, for the annual uh, Mob of Vocational Student of the Year ceremony. Uh, this year, the Valedictorian, I believe, uh, Aaron Fine from Culinary Arts. Uh, he was recognized as the Vocational Student Smith. And uh, sort of very similar to, Smith, uh, to Skills USA when you go to nationals, as Tara and Armin were saying, it's very refreshing to see that level of competition. It is very refreshing to go to Worcester every year and read the, listen to the biographies of the 50 something students across the city and what they've achieved in high school, the plays right after high school. Uh, it, it's really eye opening. So I, I want to congratulate Aaron, congratulate culinary instructors who got up to that point. So it's great to see that. And then lastly, uh, again, uh, after April vacation, we had the annual NHS induction ceremony. So when you sit there and, and you just think about the academic success of our students sitting up on the stage, sure. and uh, you listen to the, the four students talking about the four pillars of NHS, it's, again, just, it's really, really refreshing to see students achieve what they achieve in high school level. Yeah, more so, I think, at, at the vocational school. You know, Joe talks to the families, incoming freshmen in every year, that really students are double majoring at a vocational school. They have the same rigor, all the academic expectations that any high school has. But on top of the traditional academic requirements, there are all of the vocational requirements as well. So uh, it's, it's impressive. So as Mr. Raquadro said, uh, we're making some progress finally uh, with the horticulture building. <clears throat> We had a building committee meeting earlier today, and I was I was proud to announce that we're sort of transitioning into the next exciting phase, and that's the construction phase. Uh, so again, we went through the feasibility study, we went through the design phase, uh, we've been through all the bidding uh, process. So as of May 13th, uh, the bids came in for the general contractors. Uh, the low bid uh, has been accepted, and the, the winner and who will become our general contractor is Kiter Corporation. They're literally, you can walk up to their headquarters up in Florence. Uh, I know Scott Kiter uh, is on our carpentry advisory program. He's very committed to the school, very committed to the community. Uh, I'm very happy to see that he won that particular bit. Uh, and I know he's very, very, 
Center setting as well. Uh, I, I just want to, again, reiterate how impressed I was with his bid. Uh, prior to the general contractor's bidding process, they have what's called the file sub-bid process. So all of your uh, subcontractors, your electricians and your uh, carpenters and masons and plumbers and so on and so forth, uh, they have to submit their bids for the job. And we go through that process. After going through that process, uh, when you added up all of the low bids of the subbidders, uh, the subcontractors, we were approximately six hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars over the estimate. Uh, so I was losing sleep at that point, thinking I was going to have to stand in front of all of you this evening to say we are already over budget. Uh, and that was before we had the general contractors come through with their bids. Now we had three pre-qualified general contractors. They had access to all of the bids from the filed subbids, so they knew that we were already behind the eight ball. And uh, even with that said, uh, Cutter Corporation came in uh, with the final bid. They got us back under the estimates. So they were back on track. Uh, so I can't say enough about that. I've been able to sleep relatively well. It'll be much better after next June. It'll be under control. How many bids were there? For the general contractors, three. Okay. I think it's uh, um, remarkable that we had um, it's come in for the amount of money that we have budgeted for the project. You know, knowing what's gone on with the animal control facility, seeing, reading what's happening in the university with the Jones Library. Um, you know, I, I, I was holding my breath for sure, and it was just wonderful that, that he was able to get like, three bits and then you know, came with me on budget. Yes. So, uh, next Tuesday, May 28th. Uh, will be the first official construction kickoff meeting. Uh, so as a reminder, typically Tuesday mornings, I've been meeting with SMMA, which is our design services, uh, the architect firm, along with Schoolhouse, our project manager. Uh, it's been sort of a standing meeting every Tuesday morning for updates. That's been transitioned to now these construction meetings, uh, which will be spearheaded by Kyder and his team. So uh, again, <coughs> right around the corner. Uh, the building per permit had, will be submitted this week to the city. Uh, we were being told that it's up to 30 days for approval, so we want to get that uh, on file as quickly as possible. Uh, right now, in early talks between Schoolhouse and Kiter, uh, we do think we'll be ready for actual construction uh, at some point in the middle of June. Uh, so between getting the build building permit approved, uh, the next bullet is the builder's risk. Uh, Will Coffey, uh, he was at a meeting earlier today. He's been <coughs> working around the clock trying to support us in, in this particular project. Uh, he's working with Maya. Uh, which is the the city insurance, they're going to carry uh, the village risk policy. Uh, there's been a few hiccups that we're working through. So, again, once we have the builder's risk on file, once we have the building permit uh, approved, then kind of we start putting some shovels in the ground and start building the building. So, progress. My big thing I know we, there's an agenda item for a groundbreaking ceremony, which is I want to hand out off to the trustees. It's really your opportunity, your event to, to plan. I will do whatever you wish, but uh, I'm just throwing out some ideas. And you, can, you can discuss any agenda. Um, agenda. Before you get into that, um, I should have asked this earlier today. Building permit fee, was that waived? Yes. Awesome. I talked to the commissioner um, yesterday, and so he's, he, the first thing he updated me on was that so we forward. I also got to see Scott this week, and so okay. he was very excited to do and, and Louise back being commissioner? Term, or did you? No, there um, actually. So Kevin Ross is the interim commissioner, and he's, his appointment is actually on the council agenda for next week. Yeah. But Louis is here. Louis yeah, is I heard that network. Jonathan Flax has retired. Retired. And yeah. Louis stepped up again. Well, Louis so, actually, since he retired, he's been kind of back and <laughs> doing some part time work. Okay. Yeah. So Louis's been around, but right. Kevin Ross. He, he, he will never fade active. away. <laughs> so right now I'm, I'm throwing out a date for the board to consider for a groundbreaking ceremony being Tuesday, June 11th. Uh, and my hope was to have the ceremony before the school year ends so we can have students present. And, uh, knowing Tuesday oftentimes is more open for some of you on, on, on the board. So I was recommending June 11th. Uh, we talked about it at the building committee meeting earlier today uh, at 10 a.m. was the time that was sort of thrown around. Morning time, we haven't gotten to the end of the school day yet, which is kind of beneficial. So right now, if you want to look at 10 o'clock on June 11th, and then just sort of a laundry list, and this, this laundry list grew uh, from the earlier meeting, but again, I'll 
obviously have the trustees, administrators, the instructors from the program, SMMA uh, reps, uh, schoolhouse reps, obviously Kiter and his team, Senator Cumberford and Smith College because they came through with a, a very large donation. Uh, and that's why Senator Cumberford was also identified. Uh, EEA is the Energy Environmental Affairs uh, Group, uh, state agency. They're the ones who came through with the 1.2 million in the 12th hour. That's all the wood species that we want to highlight came from them. EOE is the Executive Office of Education. They're the ones who oversee the Skills Capital Grant Programs, which is the, the dominant source of revenue that we have for this particular project. Uh, so that would be Secretary uh, Tuttweiler and his team. And then uh, finally, obviously, the Building Committee. And then today, just a few others that we're, uh, we will add to the list would be representatives from, from MAVA, uh, which is my professional organization, representative of the Governor's Office, alumni, representative of Sabadosa, uh, the media, the public and, you know, as a whole, MEAC. So, anyways. going to be a big one. Yeah, but they are kind of show you. <laughs> True. So, anyways, I, I just share that. We can to discuss in more detail, obviously, uh, later on in the agenda. But that's the update on the horticulture program. Uh, family and community engagement. The main newsletter. Just quickly uh, went out. So, sort of on the heels of the MAAZ Day on the Hill, I thought it was very timely to share with the school community a few of the initiatives that we're advocating for at the state level. Uh, and the hoisting equipment, uh, which is a major front burner topic for Smith Vocational. Uh, the Skills Capital Grant Funding, I, I share this with anybody who wants to listen to me, that again, in order for us <coughs> to be in existence, the Skills Capital Grant Program has to continue. Uh, we cannot fund and support all 15 Chapter 74 programs simply based on school operating budget and purpose. There's just not enough money. Uh, so the more we can advocate for that program, the better off we're going to be. And then it, as Dr. Spencer Robinson mentioned, the, the rural district aid, uh, that particular bill, uh, just as a, a clarifying point, that aid, the vocational schools are ineligible for that particular aid. So directly it does not benefit Smith Vocational. Even though approximately 80% 80, 80 of our students reside in communities that do benefit from the rural district aid. Uh, the point is, Dr. Spencer Robertson was saying, and I sort of outlined it in the newsletter, uh, I fully support this. These small communities need this support, need this assistance, so then it doesn't become a Smith versus local community. You know, we, we all have to work together and support one another. And the more support these small communities can have in the state, the better off we're going to be here at Smith Vocational. So, and originally there was um, provision for reimbursing transportation out of district, which would have really helped Help our a lot, rural yes. districts. Right. So it's been sliced and diced in multiple lines. I don't know much about this, so could somebody further explain how the vocational schools were not part of uh, the funding? Not in the language we were excluded. If we are specifically excluded in the language it says excluded. <laughs> and any Thoughts on reasons? There's um, only so much money to pass around? Well, um, yes, yes, I'd say. You know, vocational schools have their own um, sources of, of funding that um, traditional public school districts aren't eligible for. Um, these are small rural districts, right? Okay, we're a rural vocational. I mean, can we be considered rural in Northampton? Probably not so much. For some designations, we are first and foremost. Right. And so uh, other vocational schools are either going to be regional, so they're covering a lot of territory. That, you know, most of them are out in the eastern part of the yeah. state, which is more densely populated. So it doesn't, didn't, doesn't make as much sense, I don't think, for vocational schools. But, at, you know, in my mind, um, Dr. Lincoln, look, I don't know if you agree or not, but that provision for, you know, to subsidize the out of district transportation is. That's a direct benefit. Is a direct benefit to us as a vocational school. It serves a rural district. So in a way, they did get it in there. They, they are supporting this vocational school, Franklin County, probably also. Right. Pathfinder as well, maybe. We can't tag up in the Berkshire. Yeah. 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 Uh, just a, a brief update on the school-based health center. Uh, so we have officially begun some services here on campus. Uh, oh. We have wow. uh, virtually uh, okay. behavioral health. So we have some students accessing counseling services via like a Zoom platform. Uh, we have recently, uh, not hired, we haven't hired, but we have a, an on-site community health worker now through the health network. Uh, 
so she's begun in the last couple of weeks or so. So to have we differentiate, not differentiate, but describe a particular uh, caseworker. Our adjustment counselors, our school counselors, school psychologists, they do wonderful omens work with our students in-house. But we oftentimes struggle uh, based on maybe not knowing the external resources, having the means and the time to connect with the outside resources. Uh, this community health worker, that's her sole responsibility, is to work with our internal staff, work with the students, and figure out what services does that student or that family need outside, and then make those connections. You know, so that individual's like that bridge between internal and the external, uh, which is, I think, would be a great benefit for our students and our families and for our staff who struggle trying to make those connections. That's, what? A, that's a helpful distinction. Um, and in order for a student to be seen by the adjustment counselor, does it, it, ha it has to be written into their ID? Not necessarily. Not There's necessarily. students who are in need. In you know. crisis, maybe, and, and can see the adjustment counselor. Correct. And so there isn't that kind of distinction with the um, community-based health center either. Like the, that person can see anybody regardless of whether it's... It would be a referral from our staff. In their IEP or not. Ne yeah, neither one of them are IEP okay. related. The okay. behavioral health worker, that would be, it's billable through the insurer. So that's how the Hilltown Health, health Network right. is paying for the, the staff. Is, right. uh, they are billing the students, families, health insurance. Yeah. Uh, the community health worker, I, do not believe is billable through insurance, but they are supporting it. Gotcha. Thank you. And then lastly, we had some potential good news that turned into bad news. So uh, the, the director of the Hilltown Health Network had reached out to me. There was potential state funding available to purchase a modular building to have out behind the White House uh, to actually have a standalone structure for uh, the school-based health center. And uh, I, I agreed to have those conversations, unfortunately, the money wasn't there, so it's not happening. So just update <laughs> and then just some other meetings, again, community outreach, uh, various things I've been involved in. So the MIA you know, Tournament Management Committee, there's been a few meetings. Uh, you, you heard from Tara and Armin about the Skills USA competition. It is a wonderful opportunity. If you have the chance, uh, it's usually the end of April on a Friday. Go down there. It's at Blackstone uh, Regional Vogue Tech. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful to walk around and see the students compete. It really is. On May 3rd, uh, I had the opportunity to go over, uh, along with Rebecca Wanzik, we went to uh, the Connecticut Valley Superintendent's Roundtable Luncheon, Bob LePage, so again, he is the, the Assistant Secretary to Secretary Tutwiler. Uh, Bob, I, I personally feel, is single-handedly uh, responsible for the horticulture building. He was the one who called me up and told me about the Skills Capital Grants and made that all happen. Uh, he is a South Hadley resident. Uh, he is very pro-Western Mass. And, uh, so he was there. Uh, great. Secretary Tuckweiler was supposed to be the speaker, he had to back out, so Bob you know, drew the short straw. And uh, he did a great job just updating all of the superintendents around CTE and what's happening uh, with Bokid. And uh, it can be contentious because you're sitting in a, a room, it's myself and Pathfinder, with the two vocational ed spokespeople, you know, superintendents, and then everybody else are the traditional superintendents. And it, it is difficult, you know, with budgets now. Uh, Superintendents are really under the pressure to balance budgets, and vocational ed is not cheap. And especially in Western Mass, these small communities are sending students to Smith Vocational at $20,000 a student plus transportation. It gets very contentious. Uh, but I think Bob did a great job uh, communicating what's happening. So that was nice. You heard great things about MAAC Day on the Hill. Uh, that was obviously a highlight. Uh, MDAR, which is the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, uh, I was asked to consult with them. Uh, they're doing some, some research just across the industry, across the entire state, what's happening and what can they do to better support agriculture across the state. And the consult with me was around education, you know, that pipeline from students to industry, what's happening, where, where's the breakdown, what can they do better. And I said, just help us find teachers to be perfectly honest. You know, we have the, the workforce there. The students want to come here for that particular industry, but if we don't have the teachers in front of them, then they're not going to have a workforce. <clears throat> so what can they do to better educate and recruit uh, people from the industry to become teachers? So we'll see where that goes. And finally, again, more MIA meetings. Uh, professional culture, I know uh, there's an agenda item, but I will be continuing to, to prepare and gather my evidence for the evaluation. And Dr. Spencer Robinson will 
outline that process uh, further along in the, in the agenda. So I'm just collecting all of that evidence that will be ready for next month. Donations, uh, nothing specifically, uh, but I just uh, reminded to the board how supportive the community has been over the years around scholarships. Uh, and we receive scholarships throughout the year, so I just wanted to send out a general thank you to all of those who you know, send us money for, for scholarships to support the students. And I want to thank our internal staff, Deb, everybody in the business office who processes those scholarships, and then next week we'll be handing them out at the Senior Awards Night. So very impressive. Again, as a vocational school, oftentimes we fail to recognize that college piece, that post-secondary piece. Uh, the community doesn't forget about it, and the students are, are awarded next week. So in the news, we talked about, again, thank you uh, to the students, talked about this lovely article that was out there, uh, Mr. Mendelssohn, our Spanish teacher. Hopefully this pulls up. There we are. So Neshoba Tech, uh, they're down in Weston, I think, perhaps. Uh, they sort of spearheaded this grant. Uh, they reached out to all of the vocational schools that have a foreign language program. As a reminder, uh, foreign language is not a requirement within vocational ed. Uh, students can go off to college from a vocational school and have the, the foreign language requirement exempt waived. Uh, but we felt several years ago the importance of a foreign language, i.e. Spanish, is that important. Uh, whether you go off to college or go into a career uh, that we wanted to offer Spanish here at, at Smith. So, you know, we, we hired Aaron uh, several years ago. He created the, the curriculum from the ground up. He consulted with a lot of our shops, talking about what can we do to sort of cross-curricular, you know, embed Spanish in, you know, within some of the shop learning and vice versa. Uh, so he was invited to join this team of foreign language teachers across the state from folk schools to expand on how do we embed foreign language into the shops, into CPE. The students did a great job outlining it. This was a wonderful article. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for Aaron. I think oftentimes, you know, my olden days, we call it a singleton. Okay, You have that one teacher, that one shop, and they're kind of all alone in the school. They have nobody to, to collaborate with. Uh, I, I think Aaron may feel like that sometimes. You know, he's a department of one. They really no job alike here at Smith. So for a chance for him to collaborate with other jobs like him across the state were very beneficial for him, which obviously benefits the school. So when he came and asked us if we would sign off on this grant, you know, that was a silly question. When we signed off, they got the grant, and they've been doing a lot of great work. And finally, oops, yeah. so just like going ahead, uh, again, I already mentioned the FFA chapter banquet this week. Uh, Friday is the official last school day, perhaps, and with the seniors, they have a senior picnic uh, that particular day. We go home for the long weekend, Memorial Day. Next week is what we consider Senior Week. It kicks off with Tuesday being the Senior Banquet. We have an agenda item uh, to vote on subsidizing the cost of that ticket for, and I listed it, listed it here, so if you wanted to see the numbers, uh, if, if every single person goes, so this is on, on the high end, if every single uh, vocational instructor slash folk assistant wanted to go, there's 36 of them, the two senior class advisors, the three locally elected you know, trustees, 13 administrators, you're looking at approximately $1,500. It's $28 per ticket, so just for deliberation when you vote. Uh, the following day, I have a deputy commissioner update call. It's the first time that the interim, uh, the acting commissioner, will be speaking to the superintendent, so that would be nice. Uh, that evening is the senior awards night, as I already mentioned. That's in the cafeteria. Uh, Thursday night, sort of the climax of senior week with graduation at 6 o'clock out on the football field. Obviously, all of you are invited. That Friday is a policy subcommittee meeting. And then uh, the following week uh, is the annual meeting for the Mass Iowa Workforce Board up on the Greenfield. We have the athletic banquet uh, on the same day as the Board of Trustees meeting and potentially the um, groundbreaking ceremony. With that said, I'll turn it back to the chair. Um, what is the... Rain event backup plan. The rain date is the next night, is that Friday night? Okay, right now. Okay. Bring it up, brother. Graduation? For graduation rain date. Yeah, I'm just, I know it's a week away, so it's kind of meaningless, but just wanted to see if it. Are there the principal's report? Yes, sir. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to start off saying I'm going to excuse myself after my report. My daughter has a cross game at Northampton High, so I'm going to go up and watch that. Um, so currently sitting enrollment, 570 students. 
Our first round of acceptance letters did go out in mid-April. So 150 of uh, students were offered seats. The remaining students that were accepted were placed on the wait list. Uh, as of yesterday, we have 101 first round students that have registered, so 67.3%. Uh, last year at the same time, we were at 103. So we're pacing, pacing right on, on the same number. Uh, 23 are from Northampton, which is 22.7% of those enrolled. We do have an additional five students from the initial round that have contacted the school with their intent to accept. We just haven't gotten their paperwork yet. So that number really is uh, around 106. Um, first round students have until Friday, May 31st next week to accept their seat, and then we're gonna move on. We have heard uh, back from 10 of the 150 first round offers who did decline enrolling, so they declined their acceptance, uh, and guidance will be processing the next 10 uh, students on the wait list, and that'll go out this week. School council, we held our last meeting of the year today, and the student handbook changes were approved, and they'll be forwarded to you for approval at the June meeting. Question before yes. you continue. Um, is there any follow-up on why they declined? Or just leave it at that. Yeah, you, I, I don't have on these particular 10. I know that they did explain to the guidance department members that they spoke to as to why they changed their mind. Uh, I don't have the specific for these 10, but usually we have students that apply um, both to us and Franklin Tech or to us and uh, Westfield uh, Academy, so depending on where they live, and then they choose which one they want to mm -hmm. attend. Um, we also have students who opt to stay in their district. So <clears throat> I don't have the answer in these particular 10, but I can get it for you. Uh, uh, what the overwhelming reasons are for the June meeting as the students who chose not to. So I can report that out. Okay, thank you. Um, MCAS testing is happening right now. So that's today and tomorrow. And then science testing is on June 4th and 5th. <clears throat> we have posted for an Ag Mech teacher. Um, so we are replacing a teacher that will not be with us next year, and we're currently reviewing those applications. We've begun our graduation preparations. I do wanna publicly announce, uh, these students have already been notified, as has the staff and community. The valedictorian of our class is Aaron Fine. He's from our uh, culinary arts department, and our salutatorian is Madison Gorell, uh, who is part of our criminal justice department. Aaron, if you remember earlier, was our MABA student of the year. And Madison was the Mass CTE Student of the Year for Western Region. <clears throat> uh, senior salutes are being sent out via email. I hope you're all getting those and enjoying them. Uh, the venue here is being organized. I want to thank Wanzik Nurseries again. They have agreed to donate the use of plants and flowers for the stage area, the photography area. Uh, the horticulture, carpentry, and cabinet making programs are already beginning to support graduation setup. They began with the stage today, and they're building the photography area so that'll get mounted and, and placed and there is plans um, for the preparation of the grounds um, and I do want to thank uh, Northampton who has agreed to allow us to have overflow parking uh, they do have an event at the same time but we're going to split the parking lot and uh, and it's going to be it'll be good so we'll have staff up there to make sure that we're supporting uh, them and their site and that we'll have shuttles going back and forth once that happens so I, I will say this year we are going to make one change. Um, we usually have designated parking for um, for people that might have uh, handicapped stickers or those that, that need to park close. But we are going to have spots for the trustees. So if you are, you know, coming in at that moment or going and have places to go, <laughs> uh, we're going to have spots so you can come in and you can get out if you have to. So um, they'll be right up up at the front. So pending your questions, that is my report for this evening. Yes. Question. Um, it's not related to anything in your excellent report here. Always so informative. Um, uh, I, I'm seeing Mass Core um, being talked about more and and more, and I'm wondering if it's something we have considered here or might give consideration to. And I know with um, CTE schools, there's a sub you can, you can just you don't have to meet the world language requirement. Mm -hmm. um, we could also substitute. Their shop right for world language um, but just wondering if it's something we, we thought about here we, we thought about it to be perfectly honest i think the schedule the way it is with students taking related to um, 
mandate that students are doing a four by four of, of cores plus the other stuff. I don't know if the schedule can support it. Gotcha. So we have internally talked about it in the past around when we've looked at the graduation requirements about extending the number of years for particular courses. Um, the other thing also is that with students, you know, we are about 40 to 45 percent given the year um, special education. Yeah. So there are additional services that students uh, have to get throughout their day. Right. Um, so you would have, we already have students that are because of those that we waive certain requirements. So I review those packets and then make judgment uh, based off the authority that's been granted to me by the board. So I, I, I think that we would see an increase in the number of students that would have to receive waivers um, and still receive the other services that they're entitled to. So if the state were interested in requiring mass court completion, what would we need, what would we want to be advocating for on behalf of this school so that we don't have to have a, a number of waivers? I, I, I don't know what we, I, advocating in resources or, or things from them i don't or, i don't know i think changing I think, the requirements for a school like ours yeah i don't think i just don't believe that the schedule can support it so mm -hmm. i think if we were looking at something from the state we would have to look at them being able to grant a waiver or exempt um our students because ultimately we would mm -hmm. begin having to erode certain things like the services mm -hmm. but also related on academic week right. which we already lose time on the shop week during ninth and 10th grade. So we're really just recovering it in 11th and 12th grade right. um, because we're trying to do the double English and double math to support our MCAS students. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think it would be a layered, it would be a layered question um, that we'd have to look at based on other decisions by the state. And do you think what you just said can be generalized to other vocational schools? Yes. The, the minimum number of hours that students have to have in the Chuck Terry Court program is 990 hours. Yeah. Uh, that's just as a big chunk of time. Mm -hmm. So how do you work around that? Yeah, and then additionally, I think you'd see industry-related credentials in road. Um, you know, we, when we have the um, articulation agreements, which aren't just with, you know, colleges or universities, um, but articulation agreements with unions and, and others, uh, they were trying to reach a minimum number of hours above and beyond the 990 for students to get their tiers in plumbing or their tiers in electrical. And um, if those had to shift solely into the shop week, we would begin to see the proficiency of the students decline. Mm -hmm. if, if MCATs were eliminated as a graduation requirement, would that allow you to shift your resources because then you wouldn't be having the related? courses to support, which obviously comes to a yeah. detriment to the student's education, but... I mean, it could. It could. Um, I think then we'd have a debate of how much related time do we push into ninth and 10th grade. Right. Um, you know, it, do the students have the, the... You really can't push related into ninth grade when they're coming in halfway through the year. I don't think they have the basis to mm -hmm. do advanced okay. related activities, but, you know, we could... You, you could see the possibility of 10th grade, but I think we'd have to really research it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, you bring up the uh, MCAS requirement potentially going away. And I know when Mr. Parks was here earlier in the year, last year, um, it was eye-opening to see the the data we gained from, from it that uh, gives us a way to monitor how the kids are learning. Um, so I'm assuming there's probably been discussion if the MCAS does go away, how are we going to self-evaluate? It or? wouldn't go away, only as a uh, determination for graduation. Okay. So MCAS would still be given in grades 2 through 8 and grades, grade 10, but a student wouldn't have to pass the MCAS in order to be eligible to graduate as currently required by the state. Oh, we would have to look at the question you bring forth, and you yeah. know, we had a meeting earlier in the year, and Dr. Spencer Robinson brought that same question up. So it would be something we'd have to look at because we would also have to look at the efficacy of the results when it's not a requirement. Is the same effort and time being placed? So does that data become um, like our students? Is it is it not valid? Right. If it's not right. part yeah. of a graduate. People try harder when it matters. Yeah, no, it was eye-opening for me, Mr. Hart's report when he did that. 
but there, I mean, the NAEP is the gold standard nationally, and that is not attached to, you know, there's nothing in it for students when they take it. Yeah, there's a lot of culture building that you have to do when you switch to, to something purely for diagnostic purposes. Do you have any uh, committee reports? I, think. I do. Um, uh, the policy subcommittee has not met since our last board meeting. However, you'll see on tonight's agenda two policy related votes. The first one pertains to the acquisition of library materials, and the second is an update of an existing policy that codifies the board's position on fringe benefits for support staff as discussed at last month's meeting. No, I, I can give a brief update on the, I didn't reference the expanded animal building in my report, but uh, if you have a chance to lock down there, uh, we are getting into the 12th hour of construction for the expanded animal building. Uh, so the installation, uh, the, the spring and fall has been, has been completed last week. Uh, they are finishing up that aspect, I believe, this week. Uh, the next phase will be the sheetrock, which is coming in later this week or next week. So within the next couple of weeks, we'll have the walls closed. Uh, at which point uh, plumbing and electrical will have to come back in for some finished work. We don't know yet if that will be students uh, based on the end of the school year or if we'll have to contract out for those two particular services, but we're getting very close to the end there. Uh, I do know the sewer line work um, started about a week and a half ago. That's wrapping up, so uh, that was well overdue. But they have that, that work done. Uh, so beyond that, we're finally seeing some progress. Now, how was that handled? Outside contractors or yes. was it in-house somewhere? The sewer was half the construction we see that did. And no crystals in it. Crystals not in. But there is a report in the back. Excellent. So we'll move on to new business. We have a motion to second to approve to not participate in school choice for the 24 25 school year. So moved. Second. Any additional discussion? I'll just. Going on the record, so the board is aware of why this particular recommendation. Uh, it's, it's really twofold. One, uh, the school choice differential isn't enough to educate on the on the book side, uh, so it really doesn't make a financial sense for that, that particular decision. But the larger conversation is around just the political fallout. To be perfectly frank, uh, you know, with 80% of our students coming here through the non-resident tuition program. If we then begin to allow school choice, you can imagine those families in a particular town, how do you differentiate who's coming here school choice at a much lower cost versus the non-resident program at a much higher cost? How do you work through that? Uh, it doesn't make any sense on, on any level, uh, which is why we've been recommending not participating over the last several years, but I just want the board to know that's been the stance and I fully support it. So. Thank you. May I have a motion and a second to approve an out of state open day? I thought we did. No. Sorry. Any official discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 So moved, now that I know what that's <laughs> <laughs> Second. Additional discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, hold on, just curious, how many people go? A couple uh, administrators and So we don't have, give or take, 10 to 12 students. Uh, we have uh, two to four instructors typically go. Uh, depending on the year, maybe an administrator. It's usually a larger trip to nationals for FFA than it is for Skills USA. Because oftentimes FFA isn't necessarily an individual competition, what? We'll set a team. So it might be one competition but four or five students. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So any further discussion? If not, all in favor is. Okay, got it. We have a motion to second to approve to cover the cost. That was brought up earlier for the senior banquet for vocational teachers, senior advisors, administrators, and trustees. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 
May I have a motion and a second to approve a $600 superintendent award uh, that we give out annually. So second. For the discussion. I can just give it some Fair context. Uh, so this is an annual, typically an annual award uh, that the superintendent will identify. Uh, it doesn't have to be a teacher. It can be any staff person on campus that we feel as a superintendent feels that uh, went above and beyond the call of duty, whatever that job happens to be. And um, the, the board has oftentimes voted to, to give a monetary award, uh, $600. I identify the individual. We recognize the individual on the last day of school. Uh, we are very thankful for our PTO. They put on a wonderful luncheon in the cafeteria once the students leave on the last day. And before we sort of go off on our many different directions, I recognize the superintendent award on the last day of school. So that's the context. Any additional discussion? If not, all in favor. Six hundred dollars is a good amount. Yes. Doctor Lincoln. It had been five hundred for many, many, many years. I would say a few years ago, this particular board voted to increase it to six hundred. I, I support that. And you'll let us know when you think it's time to increase it again. Well, if any board members want to increase it, yes. <laughs> good answer. We covered it. We good. All in favor. Aye. Aye. May I have a motion and a second to approve the updated policy IJL Liberty Library Materials Selection and Adoption. So moved. Second. Any uh, additional discussion? Yeah. Elaborate, explain. I can give just Cliff Notes version of <coughs> version of why you know, if you wanted to have this, and I'll turn over to Dr. Spencer Robinson and we'll be talking about more detail. Uh, if you turn the news on, I, I think, I don't mean that in a, in a negative way. Uh, unfortunately, many public schools across the country are, are being challenged on materials that are offered in the library. Uh, we have various advocacy groups, parents, uh, arguing that certain books should not be in the public library. So, uh, going to some recent law update conferences uh, over the last couple of years, uh, colleagues of mine in nearby districts who have been challenged, uh, the recommendation that's been coming out is that we really need to review as a school community or in our case of board of trustees, review the policies and procedures that we have uh, in reviewing the materials that we offer in the library. Uh, how are they chosen? How do we maintain them? How do we choose when their lifetime is up and we want to you know, get rid of them? So that was sort of the crux of why we wanted to have this conversation. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Spencer Robinson for leading the conversation. We had Leslie in as a librarian giving her perspective. Uh, great conversation. I think what is in front of you gives us a very clear set of well, policy and some procedures uh, on, on how we handle this. Uh, so that was the backstory. We just want to be out in front and make sure that we have our ducks in a row, that we have a very clear understanding of how we so approve, select, maintain, and then get rid of library materials. And I would only add that um, it was a very thoughtful process that um, Ms. Dance Hodgson provided us with um, a great language to consider from the um, American Library so Association. Yes. Um, uh, Mr. Bianca was also super helpful in those meetings yes. because he is the building administrator who will um, field any questions, concerns, complaints. Um, it was it was a really good process. It took longer than I thought it would, um, but in a good way. Right. Um, so I have lots of confidence in this um, these policies. Okay. Thank you. Further discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. May I have a motion and a second to approve updated policy GBDB support staff fringe benefits. Anybody want to speak for that? So, so yeah. moved. <laughs> Second. I, I can again give some context. Uh, so, as, as the board knows, the, the conversation around specifically around staff longevity has been discussed here at the board level. Uh, there was a vote a couple of years ago to increase the longevity for non representative groups here on campus. Uh, the conversation continued, and uh, you know, from my perspective as the superintendent, uh, there's been a lot of discussion from various stakeholders here on campus whether uh, longevity in particular should be equitable across the board, uh, equitable meaning the same 
benefit across the board? Equal. Equal. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's been a lot of conversation around that, and then that sort of then lends into other conversations about benefits. And um, so I, I felt, uh, as the superintendent, I wanted the board to sort of take the lead and take a stand on how we should handle this. And as the superintendent, I will you know, follow through on any policy. Uh, so that was sort of the call. Uh, obviously, there was discussion at the board level. Uh, the board voted, I believe it was last month or, or the month before. Didn't vote, but got the recommendation, oh, the recommendation. to, yeah. It would not be equal, the right. longevity. So I, I do want to thank Ms. Carver, uh, who was able to identify this particular policy that is already in the policy manual for the board. And uh, as we're reviewing it, uh, I, I want to thank, again, Dr. Spencer Robinson. We're looking at the policy. The updates that you see here really does codify what we are already doing. Uh, so it does not automatically create equal longevity across the board or any other equal benefit across the board. The uh, Staff who are covered under collective bargaining agreements, as the policy states, they can continue to negotiate those benefits within their collective bargaining agreement. The non-represented groups typically will fall in line with the city, uh, which has been past practice. But as we discussed, uh, the longevity for the non-represented Smith employees is higher than the current city benefit because the board voted on that. So we wanted to sort of clear that up, that language, that practice, we wanted to clarify in this particular policy. So that's what you see uh, that in general, that non-representative groups will follow city benefits, okay, unless the board decides, as a board, you have the right uh, to vote on any differentiation in, in the benefits. So that's my long-winded response. Uh, but I think this policy does align to current practice and it allows the board, uh, if the board so chooses, to increase or change benefits as, as you wish. I'm going to go ahead and read the, the um, actual uh, two sentences. So it says that um, certain fringe benefits are, just to be clear, this is the established policy that we um, revised. Certain fringe benefits are established through negotiations with employee bargaining units. Um, our support staff are not part of a bargaining unit. Because the trustees wish to be fair with all their employees, benefits they grant to employees who are not members of a bargaining unit will generally be equal to or more generous than those granted to municipal employees in similar positions that are covered by a negotiated agreement. Any further discussion? I want to explain my vote ahead of time. I'm going to abstain on this. I understand that this gives us flexibility to um, uh, to be more generous in the benefits that we award our um, support staff. Uh, I would have liked to see a policy that recognizes um, the equality in terms of the benefits. So I'm going to be a Okay. Can I, the negotiated agreement, meaning that municipal employees who are, who are not in bargaining units have negotiated that agreement? That's right, the last two words that are covered by a negotiated agreement. So support, so municipal support staff who are in a bargaining agreement to the city. Oh, so municipal support staff who are in a union with yeah. the city. The, our, this, the job alike employee of Smith, they're not in that same bargaining agreement. I see, okay. So they're sort of on this island by themselves. Okay. Um, so the past practice has been they follow whatever that benefit happens to be that was negotiated with the city. Mm -hmm. But in this particular case, the longevity example of the board voted to increase the, the longevity. I'm not sure that explains here. So. Clerical staff that work at City Hall, they're covered by a bargaining agreement, correct? It depends. Some are, <laughs> some are NR and some are okay. yeah. 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 So do we have a motion to approve our bargaining agreement? Yes. Okay. So I think we put a motion on the table. Do we have a second? It's been seconded. It's been seconded. Mm -hmm. So we're all set. Is there any additional discussion? All in favor? All right. I'll abstain as well. Okay. Abstain. Okay. The next item may have a motion and a second for discussion of superintendent evaluation. Someone else may say make the motion. I know you're going to discuss it. Just a discussion. Oh, yeah. No motion. Oh, right, right. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Okay. So we're starting the discussion then. Yes. 
Okay. Yep. So, uh, Dr. Lincoln Hooker, okay, okay for me to start us off? Please. Okay. Um, so, if you could all find the, um, the copy of the, uh, out, the evaluation process that we're using for the superintendent. So here is um, my goal for tonight is to refresh you all with what our process is for evaluating Dr. Lincoln Hoker in anticipation of our meeting next month um, so that we all know what's expected of us um, because we will be rating the superintendent next month. So I want to make sure that um, folks understand that, understand what the process is, and if you've got questions or anything, you want anything from me or from Dr. Lincoln Hoker, you can let us know. So if you see right at the top there, the um, steps that we've gone through with this process, um, much of this is from DESE, also MASC, sort of a combination of both. Um, the process started with a self-assessment um, by Dr. Lincoln Hoker. Um, the next step was analysis, goal setting, and plan development. We presented that to you all in October of 2022. Um, then of course the plan was implemented and you know that on the superintendent's reports, he ties um, the different things that he's reporting on to the, um, the goals of his evaluation as an example of implementation. Um, so the step four is a formative assessment that happened um, last July at, at this meeting. We had originally been thinking that that would be our summative assessment and we realized that the timeline was too short um, for that to be meaningful and so we made that a formative assessment and, and this meeting um, these meetings in May and June, um, some of the evaluations. So, um, again, to re refresh your, your um, memories about the standards by which you'll be evaluated, um, standard one is instructional leadership. So he promotes the learning and growth of all students and the staff, success of all staff by cultivating a shared vision that makes uh, powerful teaching and learning a central focus of schooling. Um, he's not required to have a goal under each standard. He's actually only required to have two. He elected, he added a third goal, Dr. Lincoln Hoker did last year. So standard two, management and operations, promotes the learning and growth of all students and the success of all staff by ensuring a safe, efficient, and effective learning environment using resources to implement appropriate curriculum, staffing, and scheduling. So the goal that he added last July at our formative evaluation was that policy coherence, um, we would have policy coherence related to hiring, retention, and benefits, as well as job categorization. Um, so having more clarity on when are employees part of the city and when aren't they. And I think our um, discussion we just had about the different benefits for support staff sort of highlights that tension that is on the campus. I don't mean it in a, like a tense way, but this, uh, yeah. Um, Standard three, family and community engagement. Um, the superintendent promotes learning and growth of all students and the success of all staff through effective partnerships with families, community organizations, and other stakeholders that support the mission of the school and the district. Um, so this was his first goal two years ago, um, that he would engage in regularly to, regular two-way, culturally proficient communication with families and community stakeholders about student learning and performance that's provided in multiple formats and reflects understanding and respect for different families, home languages, culture, and values. So that's the indicator for standard three, and then the goal that um, Dr. Lincoln Hoker identified for himself is described below. So by June 2024, 17 monthly newsletters will be shared with families and the community highlighting various aspects of SVAHS, including academics, vocational programs, student supports, athletics, cooperative learning, and informative articles educating the greater community around Chapter 74 and career and technical education. The newsletter will use a SMORE platform enabling easy translation and data analysis to better understand those that read the newsletter and adopt the newsletter, adapt the newsletter for greater impact. Um, so again, a reminder, we're going to be rating Dr. Lincoln Hoper on the extent to which we think he has met these goals. And then the fourth and final standard is professional culture. The, uh, the superintendent promotes success for all students by nurturing and sustaining a school culture of reflective practice, high expectations, and continuous learning for staff. The indicator that the superintendent chose for his um, second goal was uh, that he demonstrates strong interpersonal written and verbal communication skills as evidenced by regular and informative outreach to staff, families, and community members and the school committee in a manner that advances the work of the district. 
regularly seeks and considers feedback and decision making. So this is the language of his goal. By June 2024, 18 of the monthly superintendents report to the reports to the Board of Trustees will include specific information that informs the Board of Trustees of current units and instruction, projects, and topics within the academic and vocational programs. This shared information will assist the Board of Trustees when accepting a budget and creating or updating pertinent policy. So we're not going to be making these ratings up um, in our minds, having read this and understood it. Dr. Lincoln Hooker is going to provide us with all kinds of evidence to support um, his achievement of the goals that he has outlined for himself in the evaluation. And we'll review the evidence and then um, provide a rating for him. Thank you for your hard work, I don't you. You're welcome. Do folks have questions, comments, concerns? Just very quick uh, question. So the actual rating will happen in the June meeting, right. so not pre, prior to coming to the meeting where we discuss our ratings. And, um, what What are your thoughts about that? Score? Well, I don't know what the past practice has been. We've here. never done it before. Oh, oh, okay. Well, that's not true. In this way. We have had the format that, just like this, and this may be a little more detailed, gotcha. but we did use the information from the state, and we have voted before. And given ratings? And yes. Different. Okay. Yeah. So. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. So, as a group, we will formally do that in, in public in terms of doing each of the, the standards that have been set aside. Okay. It's just... Yearly? Or this is a two-year two year, two year, okay. The option is to do it individually and then before, the in advance of the June meeting and then the comp Excuse composite. Me. What are your, what's your recommendation? Oh, sure, that's, that's fine. There's only, there's only five of us, so it's fine. Right. <laughs> As opposed to ten, it's fine. Right. You think we can manage that? I think we can manage that. I, it just, But it would have been homework to actually have uh, the rubric the tool to yeah. just do the scoring and then come in yeah. to have the discussion and do the composite score. I think that's what we were originally thinking and that's why we put May and June there that uh, uh, we would get the evidence, but I think we we're gonna, we won't have the evidence until well, realistically, it. yes, I yeah, June. June. Mm -hmm. yeah. And will you be actually finished uh, by the time we meet? As far as the, uh, of having all of your artifacts, your evidence? I will have all the evidence. Okay. By the June meeting, yes. Okay. That's not nature. So that's good. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yes. So, um, it, in your professional experience, we we should be able to review the evidence that Dr. Lincoln Hoka provides us in the meeting and then give our that, readings. That's then. fine. I think this is a small enough group for it's, that quick flow. That could okay. be the only item for and the It's month. a one school district, also. Yes. Right. So. That can be the only item. That's true. That it should be. It that's should good. Be no, I mean that seriously. It's no, that's the big thing. I think it should uh, be be used for that. How much time did you use when you did it before? Uh, it, it was in depth. It was you know at least uh, an hour, and uh, but uh, with him giving evidence, in that going to take a period of time and then you want to review it and then you want to judge it so, so i um i can I, suggest one thing please. Uh, you know, that's really the, the main focus for the june 11th meeting but there might be some other business but rather than me uh preparing a traditional superintendent yeah, report i was thinking the same. i would recommend that uh perhaps i once i finalize gathering all the evidence i could share it with the trustees prior to the june 11th meeting so perhaps the, the week before, um, and that way, at your leisure, you can review the evidence and at least come into the June 11th meeting with sort of preconceived idea yeah. of what you want to share and discuss. And in that way, the and June 11th meeting, be, uh, you've already help. seen the evidence. Now it's open to the, the board. To, That'd be a big help. So, that. so no superintendent's report, limited agenda, and this is our main agenda. Right. Our, for, for our main focus. Thank you. Sounds. So Mike was the, the, it was a previous evaluation of Dr. Lincoln Hoover? Were you on the, that was, was that with Ms. Scott and Ms. Fitzgerald, so I'm not sure. No, it'd be, uh, but Mr. Peterson was the, the superintendent. Okay. Yeah. yeah, That's what I was thinking. 
Okay. And you'll provide the rubric, which were the, the, the actual scoring. Yes. Scoring yeah. Sheet. yeah. We, I, I condensed it um, okay. for I know, it's tonight nice. just to make it mm -hmm. the one page. Yeah. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next item, uh, we've already discussed about the drum breaking ceremony. Uh, and we've given a tentative date and time. Uh, so uh, we've covered that already. So that, that was June 11th at 10 a.m.? Yes. Correct. And, and that was the meeting And we will know that. I know, but I'll be coming from a stepping up uh, ceremony at one of the elementaries, but that's okay. There might be a but to be formal invitations for that. Yeah. And that is a really nice list that you had, Dr. Lincoln Hoker, for folks to include. It felt really comprehensive yeah. and, and, and definitely inclusive. And so, so I guess my question, as we develop the program, ask the chair of the board who you recommend for potential speakers. Uh, do doctor, um, Mayor, you have um, some experience at groundbreaking ceremonies. Do, are there, how, who speaks and for how long? Not long. Short um, and sweet. Yes. Yeah, yeah, short and sweet. I mean, so, I don't have that list in front of me right now, but, you know, like whoever sort of chaired the building committee, um, Mr. Potter, right. and um, I would certainly suggest Dr. Lingenhofer, um, you might want to ask Senator Comerford or, you know, yeah, see, you see who is going to respond that they're going to attend, and I think that's a great suggestion. Um, chair, trustees, you know, I think, but yeah. short and sweet, sort of. Should we use it as an opportunity for Bob for Page to get some appreciation since Andy said it wouldn't happen without him? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 All three yeah, talks. Yeah, I would, uh, How many shovels do you yeah. How many? Mr. Rodgers has a shop writer who's got the number. <laughs> when I come up with 13, 13. when I saved our specialty groundbreaking ceremony shovels when I closed down. Nice. So I have six or seven nicely chrome plated, mm -hmm. spray painted black handles, and then six or seven spray painted silver heads with black handles. They're, they're nice. They're ceremonial shovels. So we got at least 13. I have one with ceremonial one from my father way back when they built the uh, down the Hakan Road with the sewer. <laughs> well, bring it I, I mean, I have a backup. <laughs> okay. Well, Thank you. let's see what comes together. No, I'm just so anyways, we have our looking ahead. We have a lot of things over the next two weeks to attend uh, for the people that uh, want to attend these chapter banquet, the senior uh, banquet, the uh, senior awards night. We have graduation. So we have a lot on our plate that we would like to have everybody attend. And then we have the June 11th regular board meeting here at uh, 5 o'clock and July 23rd regular board meeting. So, and yeah. May I ask for your vote? Oh, um, motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Julie. That was a good presentation.